Hey there, my lovely calamities. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're diving into episode two of season one. We are almost at the end of the season two. There is one more episode left. I do hope that we get a season three. Fingers crossed. But before we jump in, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you never miss any of the new content I upload on the channel. In the second episode of The Gilded Age, titled Money Isn't Everything, the story unfolds in a dress shop teasing fans with the promise of more stunning gowns for Marion to flaunt in future episodes. While it's unlikely that the show will follow in the footsteps of Daphne Bridgerton and never repeat a dress, this exciting development holds great potential. Additionally, the anticipation builds as Mr. Rikes, a lawyer from Pennsylvania, enters the scene, casting longing glances in Marion's direction. Marion's innocence may prevent her from recognizing a man who is about to court her, but she quickly catches on when Oscar starts asking questions about Gladys. His mother, Agnes, also picks up on it and is appalled at the thought of their family's intermarrying. However, she is more accepting of rakes because he waived his fee. It seems that in these cases, the proper social payment is teeth. But Rakes isn't the only visitor today. Oscar interrupts Agnes and Ada, who are exchanging knowing looks over the lawyer's announcement that he plans to move to New York City with another potential suitor, as Agnes had requested. Being Oscar, he deliberately brings Larry Russell, the last person his mother would want to see in her living room. Agnes' reaction is priceless, especially when Marion gracefully approaches to meet Larry formally. However, Oscar's friendship with Larry isn't just to annoy his mother. That's just an added bonus. He is also using it to gain an advantage in pursuing Gladys before she officially enters society. But behold, let us now gaze longingly at the sight of Carrie Coombs' Bertha Russell gracing the screen, adorned in a breathtakingly lavish silk gown of white and gold. The elegance of her attire perfectly mirrors the opulence of her white and gold panel walls. But last, no hat to complete the ensemble, much to our disappointment. It's fortunate that she's dressed to impress, for George desires her to extend an invitation to none other than Mrs. Ann Morris, the very woman who snubbed her in social circles last week. Katie Finneran brings this character to life with her portrayal. For those who may have found it challenging to keep up with the multitude of characters introduced in the premiere, allow me to clarify. Mrs. Ann Morris is the other half of the dynamic duo known as Morris and Fane. She holds the esteemed position of charity chairwoman and squire for the War Widows and Orphans Trust. So does Fane, who had the audacity to venture into the Russell household, while Morris did not. However, George has a pressing need to entertain city alderman Patrick Morris, portrayed by the talented Michael Gill, and he kindly requests that Bertha extend an invitation to his wife. This Morris adamantly refuses to accept the Russells, fearing the judgment of others. Heaven forbid, however, Mr. Morris pays no attention to her trivial social drama. He is particularly concerned about her decision to exclude Bertha from the upcoming charity bazaar, pointing out that this would offend a powerful man's family. While Bertha may not be able to attract New York's elite to her home, the rules are different when it comes to the patriarchy. If George Russell invites you to dinner, you simply cannot refuse. In the battle of evening dresses, Bertha emerges victorious with her stunning red velvet gown adorned with a regal gold lace collar that harks back to Elizabethan fashion. Meanwhile, Morris's black and white dress may not have been as impressive, but she compensates with elegant feather and pearl accessories. However, the dress competition and the snide remarks exchanged over dinner are merely a prelude to Bertha's true objective impressing Morris by revealing the grand ballroom of the Russell estate. It almost seems like she succeeds as Morris contemplates her choices and realizes that hosting her charity event in this magnificent space would be a dream come true. Unfortunately, life is not fair. When their original venue falls through, Morris insists on spending money to rent a smaller hotel space rather than risk hosting the event in a location where Mrs. Soster, a prominent figure, would refuse to attend. Speaking of it, following her mysterious appearance at the very end of the premiere, Mrs. Oster finally makes her grand entrance at the bazaar. And guess who else shows up? Mrs. Chamberlain, who was only seen from a distance last week, now approaches Marion for a conversation. Anne, Sada, and Agnes rush in to save the day, but their efforts are thwarted by the sudden arrival of Bertha and George, leaving Agnes furious and the two of them disappearing. Now, Oscar doesn't mind the Russells driving his mother away, as it gives him yet another chance to flirt with Gladys and her fortune. 
However, everyone else is far from pleased with these unexpected arrivals, and the Russells are not here to play games. George, in particular, is not a man to be crossed. He takes one look at the small, cramped hotel and explodes with anger at the social insult it poses to his wife. To the astonishment of the ladies present, he decides to shut down the entire event by buying out and closing every single stall for $100 each. Only Mary has the courage in which to suggest haggling for $500, much to George's amusement. However, she eventually settles for the original offer. As she puts it, witnessing Sherman's march to the sea being reenacted live is not an everyday occurrence. And in terms of finances, this charity bazaar has achieved an unprecedented level of success, surpassing all previous records in terms of funds raised. However, from a social standpoint, it has turned into a complete catastrophe. Horace and Fane can only stand by helplessly as Mrs. Astor takes charge and leads the high society's abrupt departure from the event within a mere half an hour of its opening. If the previous week concluded with the victory of the established elite, this week's game clearly belongs to the newly wealthy Russells. I absolutely adore how Agnes assumes that Ada will be the first to meet her demise. It's quite amusing to think about how furious Agnes would be if Ada were to defy expectations and not obediently pass away on schedule. So it's worth mentioning that Mrs. Astor, the inspiration for Agnes, was indeed a real person and held immense social power during the Gilded Age 400. Meanwhile, downstairs, the most captivating storyline revolves around Peggy Scott. This week, she finds herself in the midst of a predicament, trying to save Mrs. Bauer from a mysterious man wearing a bowler hat who happens to be causing financial troubles. In the process, Peggy gains another alley among the staff. Peggy also manages to interfere with Reich's time in the city, but her secrets will have to wait for another week. Although Reichs may have feelings for Marion, he values attorney-client privilege too much to cross any boundaries. Shirbada and Mrs. Bruce engage in some flirtation, while Turner continues her foolish pursuit of becoming the master's mistress. However, it seems that Team Russell downstairs is once again lagging behind in fourth place. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of this episode and the snobbish treatment that the old money treats the new money of New York. Till next time, take care of yourself.